Welcome to the Postgraduate Virtual Open Day. My name is Dr John Lombard. I'm a lecturer in the School of Law. Um, if you haven't met me before, if you weren't an undergrad in the University of Limerick, um, I lecture in the areas of medical law and intellectual property law. So I teach in those areas both at undergraduate level and also at a postgraduate level. So I teach medical law one semester and intellectual property law in the next. So in today's virtual open day, what we're going to be discussing is the following. So we'll start with an introduction to the School of Law. So I'll explain kind of about some of the, the features of the School of Law, some of the resources that we have, awards that we've won, and some of the, the unique features features of the School of Law and really emphasising what our strengths are as a faculty, both in terms of the research that we conduct and also in terms of the standard of teaching that we deliver. Um, in addition to that then, um, and what you're probably as, much as, as interested in, is I'll be speaking about the postgraduate programmes that we offer in the School of Law. These are the LLM International Commercial Law, the LLM or MA in Human Rights and Criminal Justice. So if you're coming from a, a law background, your undergraduate degree was in law, then it would be the LLM rather than the MA in Human Rights and Criminal Justice. And the third degree programme then being the LLM General. So the LLM General, including modules from both commercial, the Human Rights and Criminal Justice, and some additional modules that are not offered on either of those programmes. Um, another element in this morning's talk is that there'll be a small taster lecture and this is going to be on the topic of caricature, parody and pastiche in copyright law. So what we're going to do as part of this discussion or this taster session is really just kind of illustrate the types of discussions that we have in a master's class. It will show you the step up from an undergraduate level um, and it will also kind of flag like those types of discussions, the questions that we deal with and we'll show you kind of what would actually take place um, in a master's module and hopefully that will give you a sense of kind of what we're going to be or what you would be discussing and looking at in the University of Limerick. Um, there'll be contact details provided throughout, there'll also be a, a contact detail screen provided at the end and they will all starting off introduction to the School of Law. So why exactly would you study in the University of Limerick? Well, if you're studying in the University of Limerick, you have a chance to study in an innovative, enriching and student centred learning environment. So when you're studying here, you'll see we're innovative in terms of the research that's being undertaken, but also the teaching methods that are undertaken by staff. A lot of staff in the School of Law have completed uh, graduate diplomas in teaching, learning and scholarship. So we are regularly engaged in developments in pedagogy. We are focused on how to deliver the content in the best way possible and really thinking about how best to engage with the student. Um, both in terms of our classroom discussion, but also in terms of the assessments that are set for the student. So we're not just limited to those kind of contact hours, but we are trying to really consider and re examine how we deliver these programmes in a more holistic basis. Um, we also have fantastic resources. So in among the resources we have being a moot courtroom and we also have a state of the art appeals court. So the appeals court is located in the new law library. There are later slides which will show images of the new law library. The moot courtroom is located in one of the main buildings on campus and we often use this for labs or for small group teaching. As well as that then we have the state of the art appeals court. The state of the art appeals court is used for obviously certain clinical legal education, um, but as well as that, we also use it as a venue for various guest lecturers, for guest seminars, for guest lectures that take place. Um, so what you'll often find is if you're working in the library late of an evening, it, there will often be a, a guest lecture, there'll be something going on in that appeals court. And when you're a, a postgraduate student, you're especially welcome to attend and to participate in those kind of events that we regularly run. This links in with our next point so that you have an opportunity to learn from internationally recognised law experts 
and guest lecturers. So about two years ago, we had Dean Strang, who featured as an attorney on the Netflix documentary series, Making a Murderer, um, the, as a resident kind of lecturer in the University of Limerick. So he was a, a guest lecturer for a semester and he delivered uh, a number of lectures in the areas of jurisprudence. In addition to that, then we also have uh, law experts and law lecturers from other uh, countries that would visit and would regularly give seminars at a postgraduate level. Um, so as part of this in the last semester alone, we would have had lecturers from Brazil, we would have had lecturers from uh, France and from Portugal, and all of those lecturers would have delivered uh, classes at a postgraduate level, would have engaged with our students and given them a degree of insight into what the law was like in another jurisdiction. We also have exceptionally high employment rates from our programmes from an undergraduate level, um, we obviously had law and accounting, which is a, a very, very high employment rate across a five year period, but this also follows true to our master's programmes. And you'll see later on that the LLM in international commercial law has a very, very high, close to 90% employment rate among its graduates in the first year after graduation. And as mentioned, we obviously have those strong international law links. We're also an award winning law, law school. So we won Law School of the Year in 2017. We uh, won the Grada Ireland Postgraduate Course of the Year for Law in 2018. We had two courses shortlisted this year, and we also won the Disciplinary Excellence in Learning, Teaching and Assessment Award in 2018, so the Delta Award. So for a student, all of these awards can seem a little bit abstract. It might seem a little bit separate from your day to day activities. However, the reality is that these awards are a recognition of the programme content, the stakeholder engagement, the research being conducted by lecturers on these programmes, and also a recognition of the standard of teaching. And this is a really important element and it's something which I touched on already. It's one thing to have really good and high quality research being conducted in a faculty or in the School of Law, but this must also be married with appropriate teaching and pedagogical methods. So what you'll see with the lectures in the School of Law is that we are all very keen to take that research that we're conducting and to bring it into the classroom, to bring it into the seminars and that we can discuss what research we're engaging in and have it kind of thrown open to discussion among the students. So that's a really important element that we marry the research with the teaching and you'll experience that at the LLM level. We have images on the current slide of the UL Law Library. So this is a state of the art law library. It opened in September of 2018. Um, it's part of the Glucksman Library. You can see the scale of it set out on the, the current slide. Uh, we now have two purpose built moot courts to develop students' lyring skills. Um, overall, we have 340,000 books in the library and we have well over a quarter of a million electronic journals. Um, in recent months, we obviously had to have a, a shift to more online resources. In that respect, the School of Law engaged quickly with our law librarian. We identified appropriate resources, ebooks, materials, and made them, to made them available to our students as quickly as possible. So we changed over our reading lists to reflect that. And it means that now we, in addition to the physical books that we have, we also have a large amount of digital or ebooks, which can be accessed from any location once a student logs in to the Glucksman Library um, through their student portal. Um, other points here in relation to why law at the University of Limerick. So we have outstanding academic staff who are internationally recognised as experts in their fields. This is linked with the fact that we have active research centres and research clusters. So we have a centre for crime, justice and victim studies. So this would link in very closely with the LLM on human rights and criminal justice. We also have an international commercial and economic law group. Um, again, the research that would be conducted by that group would align closely with the teaching that would take place on the LLM in international commercial law. Um, as well as that, then we have centres or we have clusters for uh, understanding emotions in society. And more recently, we have a health law and policy research cluster established. 
Um, we have competitive fees. Um, you fees are listed on the current slide, and we also offer a, a scholarship to the incoming student with the highest marks um, that are entering the program. Uh, the entry requirements for the LLM are set out on the current slide. Uh, so places are, um, it is off a competitive basis. There are limited places on each program. In general, what is required is a, a second class honours degree at a minimum in an undergraduate law degree or in another primary degree in which the legal component accounts for at least 50% of the whole program. In exceptional circumstances, if an applicant cannot satisfy the undergraduate, undergraduate requirement, they may be accepted on the basis of relevant professional experience. There are also English language requirements that must be met. Um, this may be of particular relevance to international students. So applicants whose first language is not English must provide evidence of either prior successful completion of a degree qualification taught through the medium of English or satisfy other criteria. So for instance, IELTS scores. So the first postgraduate program I'm going to be discussing is the LLM International Commercial Law. This can be taken as a one year full time program or a two year part time program. The program would obviously be particularly attractive to law graduate graduates who wish to develop a specialization in commercial law. Um, and you'll see that on the next slide with the modules that are taught on this particular program. There's particularly good employment prospects in Ireland and abroad. Over 88% of graduates are in employment within a year of graduation. Students who undertake this module or undertake this program will develop legal research and other transferable skills. And the program tends to focus on the increasing internationalization of commerce. So if you decide to study the LLM, International Commercial Law, some of the modules that you might go on to study include the following. So international business transactions, law of credit and security, regulatory crime, global competition law, international protection of intellectual property, counter-terrorism law and international business. And you would also have seminars by international legal scholars and leading commercial practitioners. So from those modules, the one I can speak to is international protection of intellectual property. So I co-teach this with a colleague, Dr. Alan Cusack. And in this module, we look at issues relating to copyright, trademarks, patents, and a design law. So they are the main areas that we tend to examine on this particular program. So on my part, I tend to look at issues relating to copyright and issues relating to trademark. And you'll get a taster later on of what those types of lectures are like and the types of discussions that take place and what it is that we focus on. Career opportunities linked with the LLM International Commercial Law include uh, careers as a solicitor or a barrister who would specialise in commercial law, careers in academia, banking, private industry operating internationally, and also opportunities in government and European institutions. If you want further information on the LLM International Commercial Law, um, there's more detail on the website. The link is uh, seen on the current screen. The course director for the program is Ms. Sinead Eaton and her email address is listed there, sinead.eaton at ul.ie. If you'd like to see a student profile and what a student experience is like on this particular program, then you can see there's details provided on the AHSS blog where Ashlyn Croke outlined her experience of the LLM International Commercial Law Program. So we're moving on to the second program that we offer, the LLM or MA in Human Rights in Criminal Justice. So again, this can be taken as a one year full time program or a two year part time program. Um, it's obviously open to people who would have completed an undergraduate degree in a related field. So the program tends to emphasize the interrelationship between the disciplines of human rights and criminal justice. It's aimed at talented graduates in law or a related discipline who have, would be for people who have an interest in working in the field of international human rights and criminal justice or policing. 
The programme aims to foster general and specific skills relevant to, mo to the modern criminal justice system, both in Ireland and in interna inter and internationally. And this is one of our shortlisted courses this year. Some of the modules that you'd study on this programme include the following. So criminal justice processes and sentencing, international criminal law, policing and human rights, criminology, penology and victimology. Again, you'd have a range of guest lectures and seminars by legal scholars and leading practitioners in human rights and criminal justice. And each year students undertake a student visit to both the prison and the Garda station in Limerick. So this is an element of the programme which is overseen or closely overseen by the course director, Dr. Jer Coffey. And the idea behind this is that it gives the students a degree of practical insight into the material that's being covered in other modules. Career opportunities linked to the LLM and MA in human rights and criminal justice <clears throat> include careers in the legal profession, specialising in human rights and criminal justice, careers in academia, Students often go on to work in NGOs, both nationally and internationally, careers in policing, and also careers in advocacy, which would incorporate human rights and criminal justice theory into practice. For further information on the programme, again, you can consult the law link on the website there or contact the course director, Dr. Jared Coffey. His email address is listed there on the screen, jared.coffey at ul.ie. And if you want uh, insight from a student and what a student experience is like, again, you'll find uh, uh, details on the AHSS blog with a profile from Michael Carmody, a former student on this program. So the third program to discuss is the LLM General. So the LLM General tends to have modules from the LLM International Commercial and from the LLM Human Rights in Criminal Justice. So if you're not sure what route you want to pursue, then the LLM General is a very good option. Once again, this can be taken as a one year full time program or a two year part time program. It's designed to enhance students legal skills and to enrich their knowledge of a variety of legal subjects across a broad spectrum ranging from criminal law to competition law, property and human rights law. So it's suited to those looking for an advanced legal education, but who do not wish to focus on a single branch of law. And this was the postgraduate course of the year in law in 2018. So some of the benefits of the LLM general include flexibility. So this is a major advantage of this program. You're not tied to a commercial route or to a, a, a criminal justice route. Instead, you get to select modules from a range of different programs. So you can choose from your criminal justice, your human rights and commercial law modules. And you can see this on the student statement on the current slide from Kevin Hooley, who recognised the, the flexibility that the programme offered and also offering the student an ability to tailor the programme in accordance with their interests. So quite often, if a student starts off in the LLM general, over time, they'll kind of maybe get an idea that there's a particular area that's of interest to them. They can select modules or more modules in that area, obviously, and then can shape a thesis around that area as well. So modules you'd study on the LLM general. As mentioned, you've modules from both commercial and the criminal justice side. So the likes of the International Protection of Intellectual Property, you've policing human, right, human rights and criminology. But in addition to that, you also have a handful of modules which are offered exclusively on the LLM general programme. These include contemporary challenges in medical law and ethics and advanced family law. So as mentioned at the outset, I obviously lecture in the area of intellectual property, but I also lecture in the area of contemporary of the, in the area of medical law. So I'd be the lecturer for contemporary challenges in medical law and ethics. So programs like this at a master's level are really interesting because it gives the student a degree of control over the content that we focus on. The idea of that particular module in medical law and ethics is that it responds to developments that arise. So in the next semester that we're delivering this program, we'll be focusing on issues relating to public health 
and we'll have a discussion of regulations, laws in relation to COVID, the way in which standards are applied. So we're, we're responding to what the developments are in society. So it's not a module which has just been written up once and has been left at that. Instead, the module changes even week to week, depending on what's in the news or depending on what students want to discuss in slightly more detail. So we can be responsive to those developments. For further information, again, the website link is on the screen. The course director for the program is Eddie Keane, and he can be contacted at eddie.keane at ul.ie. OK. So we'll be coming back later on to a question and uh, questions and answers section. So if you have any questions in relation to those programs, you'll be able to discuss them and, or to be able to raise them and we'll come back to them in about 10 minutes time. What we're going to do now is to give a brief taster lecture. So if you decide to do the LLM International Commercial, you might be in my intellectual property class at some point, and we'll be having a discussion along the lines of what these few slides set out. So what we're looking at here is caricature, parody and pastiche in copyright law. So this might seem as if kind of a, an unusual topic, but what caricature, parody and pastiche provide are defences to copyright infringement and they're new defences. So this is something which we just added to the programme about two years ago. So we've discussed it the last two years and we did so in response to developments at the time. So to give you a sense of what this area is and to get you up to speed, if we're looking at this in the area of copyright law, we'll be starting off with a discussion of what exactly is copyright. Um, for anyone watching, to put it simply, copyright is a property right. It's a right which authorises a person to control the physical reproduction of a work. It gives a degree of control over the performance of a work. So protection for uh, a work that's created, whether it's a literary work, a dramatic work, a musical or an artistic work, is automatic. You have no formal registration procedure. So if you sit down later today and you draw, you, you know, you paint something or you write a short story, you don't have to go out and seek registration to protect your intellectual property. It's automatic. So this is what you have a copyright. It gives you these rights. It's a very kind of strong form of protection, but you don't have those formalities that you have to engage with. Um, you'll get copyright protection in the work provided the work obviously satisfies some criteria. It has to be original, so you can't have a copy from someone else. It has to be tangible and fixed, so it has to be set out very, very clearly um, what it is that you're looking to, uh, looking to protect. And it has to be within a category of copyright works. So generally what we mean is that it should come under a, be either a form of literary work, a dramatic work, a musical or artistic work, and there are rather broad categories that can capture quite a lot. OK, so this is a sense of what copyright is, and we'd spend a, a kind of a, a good chunk of the introduction, uh, introductory class discussing the nature of copyright, discussing the appropriateness of having uh, automatic protection and discussing issues in relation to originality, standards of originality. And those are things we tease out in a, a slightly longer period of time. We'd also discuss in the early classes the development of copyright law. So we don't just start with this is the law as it exists at the moment. Instead, what we want to do is to give you a sense of why exactly is the law the way it is at the moment? What came before it? How has it developed over time? And in particular, what are the arguments that shaped the development of law over a long period? So if you look, if you do copyright law, we'll be starting back with St. Colm Kill back in the sixth century. So St. Colm Kill was involved in a, a rather famous dispute at the time. He copied a number of gospels that he didn't have permission to copy, and this led to one of the first copyright disputes that arose. So a challenge between St. Cullum Kill and another Irish saint. Um, we do come forward in time then and we can look at things that are clearly set out in paper, looking at the Engraving Act of 1734, the Copyright Act of 1814, looking at the development over time and what we tend to draw out in these discussions is the relationship between societal interests, the interests of the individual, how these are balanced and how these change over time. 
So we discussed that and it would bring us right up to the year 2000. And in the year 2000, we had the Copyright and Related Rights Act. And this is kind of our principal legislation in this area. It's been amended on a number of occasions and we looked mainly at the 2007 amendments. And then more recently, we had the Copyright and Other Intellectual Property Law Provisions Act of 2019. So a rather long title. Um, with that 2019 Act, it brought about a number of changes. One of these is that it provided a defence to copyright infringement where the work was being used for the purposes of caricature, parody or pastiche. OK, so when that 2019 Act was introduced, we changed around the class in relation to defences and we had a class that focused specifically on ideas of caricature, parody and pastiche. So what we wanted to do is consider how is this defence likely to be interpreted? What do we need to look at? What sources do we need to look at? What resources do we need to engage? So once you've completed a programme like the LLM International Commercial, you know that the law will change in the future. It's not something which is, you know, just kind of set and won't change at any point in the future. So what you want to be able to do is to respond to those developments. And classes like this are really important in giving you the skills and equipping you with the ability really to respond to those developments. So you'll have an idea of what the arguments behind it are, where to look, what debates to look at in a particular area, and what questions you should ask or consider for when the law does change. So in addition to looking at all those domestic or sources from England as well, we would also consider a range of international influences. So we discussed the likes of the Berne Convention, Rome Convention, WIPO treaties, TRIPS agreement, and we discussed the relationship between these and how these shape the legal framework in Ireland. So as I mentioned, if you uh, if you use a copyright without work, it's essentially infringing copyright. This occurs where a person has no license to exploit the work. It occurs where someone would copy, make available or adapt a work without permission. But defences to copyright have developed and are recognised in legislation. And this is controversial due to competing rights. So it ties in with what we discussed earlier in the module, or we would discuss earlier in the module. So we'd recognise that well, what you have here is an individual who owns the copyright in a work. They have the rights, they have an interest in controlling it, but yet there are other or broader interests and societal interests which demand that that copyright work be opened up a little bit for greater exploitation. So there's a number of defences uh, in using a copyright work. So you might argue that you had permission or at least you thought you had been given permission. So you've expressed or implied authorization. You have ideas of fair dealing. You have a public interest defence. You have arguments for incidental inclusion. So, for instance, you create an image, you take a picture and someone's copyright work is in the background. It might be your main focus. So you can argue, well, I included it, but I didn't mean to. And you also have parity. So parity is introduced by the 2019 Act. Um, originally, it was in the Information Society Directive. We decided not to introduce it um, for a number of years and wait until that 2019 Act. And parity is really challenging. This is why it was interesting to discuss. Parity has to mirror the original. It implies the original work as a constituent part of its own structure. So unlike other areas or other defences, what you are saying here is yes, there is a link. And in order for it to be successful, people have to be aware of that link. So how do we define the framework in such a way that it can allow for these types of defences? The other element here, obviously, is that it has to be a comic imitation of an original work of art. So you have a really difficult balancing exercise to undertake in these types of cases. So you can see examples of parody on the current screen. So Sesame Street is being is particularly useful for these examples where you have the likes of furry potter and sharing things instead of stranger things and rather good examples of uh, forms of parody um, to look at in practice. We also discuss issues relating to caricature and pastiche. So we have definitions of caricature there, we have definitions of pastiche set out, but the main issue we dealt with in the class is that we don't have a statutory definition for these concepts. So how would you define and apply these concepts in practice? You're presented with a new piece of legislation. It has a new defence which hasn't been applied before. How do you interpret it and how do you go forward with it? So we looked at the relevant provision and what we said is that our interpretation of it is likely to be shaped by a case called Diekmann, a case which came from Belgium originally. So this was the next place we went. 
the students were given a reading, a signed reading, they went away and they read up about this particular case. So the issue in this particular case was obviously, as we come across in all of these cases, that there was an issue of copyright infringement. One side was arguing that someone had infringed their copyright, and on the other side, you had a party arguing that there couldn't have been any copyright infringement, they had a legitimate defence. So, if you're looking at the current slide, you'll see on the left hand side, um, uh, which is the original image, and on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see the modified image. So the background to this is it involved uh, a, a Belgian politician, he was a right wing politician, Johan Diekmann, and he distributed copies of a calendar at a New Year's reception in Ghent back in 2011. The cover of the calendar, as you can see, was modified. It depicted the mayor of Ghent at the time and it tended to portray a right wing image. Naturally, if you're the original copyright owner in the work, you won't be particularly happy about this relationship or this connection being established. So the owners of the copyright in the original work argued that this infringed their copyright and it should be prevented. The argument advanced on behalf of the Belgian politician was that this simply was a form of parody, nothing more. So as the case progressed, we ended up with several questions being submitted under Article 267 of uh, TFEU. And the questions included the following. So is parody to be interpreted uniformly across EU member states? If so, what conditions and characteristics should a work satisfy in order to be treated as a parody? And are there additional conditions for a work to be labelled as a parody? So in relation to the first part and answering the first part, bear in mind, we started off with the area of intellectual property. We then had to consider issues in relation to caricature, parody and pastiche and how they're defined. And now we're looking at an area of EU law. So it's giving you good kind of exposure to a range of different areas. So we look at the way in which it's set out and we recognise that parody is to be given uh, as ours to be viewed as an autonomous concept of EU law. So it's to be given the same interpretation across all different jurisdictions. In relation to the second element, we recognise that there was two general elements that came out from it. The first is that the work should tend to evoke an earlier work and the second point is that it should have a, a comic element to it. So what types of discussions would this give rise to in a class? So what we tended to focus on and what we discussed was the following. What exactly does it mean to evoke an earlier work? How do we assess humour? So one of the challenges here is that if we view it as an autonomous concept, does this, what type of challenges does this present? Because we're essentially arguing that there is a, a common interpretation across Europe of what caricature, parody, pastiche, so what exactly is comic? And we, in the class, we've uh, discussed the issues and the challenges that can arise in these issues. We looked at whether caricature, pastiche and parody are synonyms under this particular case and what challenges this would present. We look at where we looked at how to interpret fair balance and its relationship to fair dealing. We looked at issues about whether this type of decision opens the door to private censorship. And we also examined the role of human rights and moral rights in shaping this exception. So from a really kind of narrow base, looking at a new defence in Irish legislation, we engaged with European Union law, we discussed, with, we re engaged with issues relating to human rights, private censorship, moral rights in the context of intellectual property law. And the idea of this is that for students who engaged in this discussion, the next time they, uh, they, they encounter a new piece of legislation, they're able to think more critically about it, to consider how it's to be interpreted, to look, I know what resources are out there and to really raise questions about it, how it can be interpreted and applied in the future. OK, so that's a, a brief taster of what exactly we discuss in an intellectual property class at LLM level. The various points of contact are set out on the current slide. So the course director again for the LLM International Commercial is Ms. Sinead Eaton. The course director for Human Rights and Criminal Justice is Dr. Jared Coffey. And for the LLM General, it's Eddie Keane. Email addresses are on the current slide. So if you do have any questions afterwards or after this webinar ends, feel free to get in touch with them. Okay, the last slide here is just a thank you for our site. There's a social media channel. So 
if you want more details about what's going on in the School of Law, there's lots of different ways to connect with us. So we have a Twitter account, we have a LinkedIn account, we have a YouTube account, which includes resources for incoming students, and we also have a, a Facebook account. So you'll find lots of different news information on the seminars that we undertake um, on all of those various social media channels. And if you do have more questions and you want to reach out through social media, certainly feel free to use the, either the, the School of Law Twitter account or the Facebook account to ask any questions. OK, I'll we'll leave it there. If anyone has any questions, obviously feel free to get in touch. Um, with the contact details that were provided for the various course directors um, uh, over the course of these slides. Thank you very much.